Hi, welcome to this Bermad Technical Seminar. Colin Kirkland is my name, and I'm one of the engineers at Bermad Water Technologies. The purpose of this technical training seminar is we believe it's going to be useful for any designers, operators, or engineers who are designing a pressure reducing station in water supply to share 30 odd years of experience, which we have in Australia, of designing good and bad stations, and to be able to go into many of the aspects which might assist you in the design of a station. So with that, let's get started and get into the content. The content which we're going to provide here, one of the things that we found is really essential before designing a station is really to get the correct information to enable us as a manufacturer to really uh, design the right size of valve, the right station and the right sort of design. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the information that we really think we need from you for, to enable us to uh, get that design done correctly. Once we've got a lot of that information, we're going to talk a lot about the sizing logic that we use and why we use a single valve or multiple valves for that type of design. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. We're going to show you some of the software which we use, which really takes out the risk of uh, selecting that particular valve size. So the software which Bermad has is, has had many years experience and really gives us a lot of confidence at what we're going to do. And we'll share that with you and show you how we use that to its best benefit. Um, sizing the valve is only part of the solution. So part of the, the critical nature of any design is really thinking about uh, do we, how do we design the station? Do we put it above ground, below ground? And we'll talk a little bit about the pros and the cons. And this will maybe give you and help you in your selection process when you're going into the actual detail of how the final design looks. Um, the, the thing that we've found is really important is that designers a lot of the time have a, a great idea of what they want, but this seminar is based on talking to operators, talking to people who do maintenance on the units, plus people who are designing. So all these different people have a different concept in what they think is useful and practical, and that'll discuss some of the pitfalls relating to some of the main maintenance on the valve, because the, one of the critical things is, of course, it's great to design it, but how are we going to work on it? And is it practical to work on it in its present design? So we'll talk a little bit about that too as well. Um, we'll talk about some of the components external to the actual valves which have an impact on the performance of the pressure reducing station. One of the things we'll talk about is do we need a strainer before the valve? Is it something that's, that's needed? Is it practical? And we'll talk about the pros and cons of that. Um, when we design a station, one of the things that impacts the performance on the valve many times is air. And we don't like air in any pressurized pipeline. So we're going to talk a little bit about the design of the air valve we should suggest to use in particular designs and uh, where to locate them and how to get the best performance out of that design too as well. And also um, there's uh, when you look at data catalogs sometimes you will see a pressure relief valve downstream. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the pros and cons of using one of those and some of the design implications of putting one of those in, in a network. Okay, so Let's start from the scratch. Um, if someone was coming to Bermad and they were asking us uh, to, to assist in the sizing and the selection of the valve, what is, what is some of the information that we actually need to enable us to start the ball rolling? So the first thing is it's a little bit about the general description. So what I'm getting to there is, um, is this water supply? Is it drinking water? It's going to be in a major city. Is it going to be a raw water pressure reducing station providing to a treatment plant? So we want a general idea of the, the application description and to know what it is we're dealing with before we start. The water quality is really critical. So there's different things which we do if we are doing one for drinking water or as opposed to maybe raw river or dam water that's running to a treatment plant, or it could even be potentially a treated effluent or recycled water pipeline station, which has different aspects to as well. So we want to know a little bit about the water quality that we'd expect in that station. But when we get right down to the hydraulics, there's a lot of information which really helps us give a really comprehensive uh, selection on the valves. First thing is to really understand what we, we talk about it as Q-min. We talk about the minimum overnight flow rate. So we're trying to understand if this was a brand new subdivision, we're trying to understand, will the flows go to zero 
or is there some leakage in the network where it might get down to two, three, four liters a second? We want to know what the minimum flow rate will be through this station. We want to know the average daily flow rate. So what we're, we'll go into this in a little bit more depth, but we're trying to understand the, the nominal average flow through the station is, is 20 liters a second. And that happens usually at nine o'clock during the day. And we want to get a bit of an idea. So we're wanting to get the the 75, 80 percentile of where the valve is going to be operating in in the bulk of its time. We also need to know what the maximum daily flow rate, the maximum daily flow rate is going to be. So we have to consider that in the highest demand times. So that could be summer. It could be right in the peak of summer when everyone's watering the gardens and uh, there's a lot of usage of water with people showering and, and, and living. So we want to know what the valve has to cope with at its maximum too as well. And that's really quite critical. When designing a pressure reducing station, that's not only feeding reticulation, but it's feeding uh, commercial buildings and everything else. There's what we call a fire flow rate. So um, let's talk about in a city, in a city arrangement that could well be that uh, you know, on those very extreme days that we need the ability to also be able to cope with uh, a fire condition. Or it could be a rural installation where we're out in the country and uh, there's potential in a one in two or three yearly event that we have a bushfire or something else where all of a sudden the potential flows could rise to a very high level. And we like to get a bit of an understanding of what that potential fire flow requirement is, if indeed that's part of the, the design itself. Now, it's all good to know what the flows are that we need and the pressures today, but we're not designing for, to, well, we are designing for today, but also for the future. So in, in a world where the population is rising all the time and we're getting more and more people, we want to know potentially what the maximum design flow is going to be in 10 years, 15, 20 years, 30 years, because one of these stations is really being designed uh, for the long term. You know, a typical life of a PRV is, you know, 20 to 40 years if it's maintained and operated correctly. So we want to take or ask the question if you've got a snapshot idea of what we think you might think the flows might be in the future. And what that really helps us do is really determine what the design will look like, whether we need to put redundancy or think about the sizing and, and how we design it for the future going forward. Now we've spoken about flows. So now about pressures. So pressures are really important. Um, we really need to understand the maximum inlet pressure. So this is the maximum head that we're expecting to see at the inlet side of the valve. Really important for us to know from cavitation and performance and sector two as well. We want to know the average pressure. So this is roughly what the pressure is going to be through the day. So we can understand how the valve is going to perform and the lowest inlet pressure. So that might happen in the very hot days where you have um, you know, excessive flows going to to everywhere and the inlet head drops through to head loss in the network. So we're interested to know that lowest pressure too as well. And of course, the most important thing for a pressure reducing valve is what is your downstream pressure you want? So uh, in many instances, we call that the P2 pressure and a pressure reducing valve only cares really about one thing and it's maintaining that pressure. Now, the thing about the downstream pressure is, is that it's a fixed, it's a fixed uh, situation. That's what the valve cares about. Maybe in your design, you may want to modify that pressure. You may want to be able to have different pressures at different times of the day. So if you're planning on doing pressure management or having a step situation where you want to change that pressures, just give us that information and that helps us then look at the design of the valve. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more depth about the flow rates that I was talking about. It's really important to understand this graph that we're looking at on the left here uh, the, the horizontal axis is showing as the 24 hour clock and the vertical axis there is showing as the flow rate in liters per second. Now, this is not exact, but this is a typical thing of what we would generally find in a water reticulation network, where we tend to see the peak flows tend to happen in the morning when people are waking up, uh, they're showering, they're having breakfast, uh, the, the demand is quite high in the network at that point. Then as people go to work or start their daily lives, you know, the flow is going to drop off. You might get little peaks around lunchtime. And then, you know, potentially we might tend to see some peaks again later in the day. So this is what a typical peak or, or demand will look sort of thing. So this is what we're talking about, trying to understand what that minimum overnight flow will be. So we can see here it's down less than two liters a second. But, you know, during the day, you know, we're expecting the flows to get up to odd 16 odd liters a second. So this is what we mean by the average daily flow, right? 
The fire flow rate, well, this isn't a given. This isn't a fixed, well, it's 20% more than the maximum. It's, uh, it's whatever the design of the system is going to be. If it was a rural network where uh, we're out in the country and there was a lot of fire hydrants, you know, this could be um, 30, 40% more than the maximum flow. Or if we're in the city, it could be 5% more. But that's up to you to, to advise us where you think the requirement might be. Because one of the things that is really essential for a building or a fire network is that if you don't have sufficient pressure, uh, you can't achieve the firefighting results that you want to, to, to want to achieve. So if we haven't considered this in the design of the valve and all of a sudden the valve is the choking point that we simply can't deliver that, the ramifications are not good. So it's important to speak about this now. And here we can see on the graph, we can see the red line where potentially it's mirroring the this average daily flows, but it's just showing what potential we might actually get to as a maximum. Now, future daily flows. So this is a bit of pie in the sky sort of thing, but Let's think about areas that, um, say, down at uh, holiday-making areas by, by the ocean. Um, a lot of people, you know, as they're retiring, may want to move to the ocean. And uh, those uh, the developments in those uh, areas tend to grow considerably. So the thing is here, we're trying to get an idea what the flows are going to be today, but what they're going to be in 10, 20, 30 years' time from now. And most planning uh, councils and water companies have a good idea of what they think potentially it might be going forward in the future. And this is really important to know to know. It's not, it's not absolutely critical. When we design a station, we don't design it so much on the edge that it's going to fall over if we have a 20% increase in flow, but it's just important to know it. So for example, looking at this picture on the right hand side, we can see a 50 millimeter train on the left hand side where that does 99.9% .9 of the flows. Uh, but in the, uh, in the event that we have a fire or we have a situation where they want to fill a reservoir in a rare an event or something else, it's not going to keep up. So the, the train on the right-hand side is going to supplement that and, and uh, uh, enable us to, to continue that flow. And then the bypass in the middle might be that look, we don't want any pressure reduction in the event of fire. We're just going to open this and whatever. So it's giving you an idea of what we really need to consider. So they, these, they are the flows that we we're talking about, which I spoke about in the start. And if you're in any doubt with any of this, the whole thing is, is just to communicate with Bermad. And it's not that we can't provide a design without that, but it's handy to know, and it's good future planning too as well. So let's talk a little bit about pressures. Um, usually a pressure reducing station might be on a dedicated pipeline, or it might be on a T branch coming off a dedicated pipeline supplying a DMA. But one of the things that we find if we look at the graph on the left here is that it's very important for us not just to know what the maximum inlet pressure is going to be, but we want to know what that inlet pressure is going to be at varying flows. Now, why that's important, if we look at this graph here, we can see that this is the, the pressure that we're tracking at the inlet side of this pressure reducing valve. And we can see that at very little flow, we have 80 to 90 meters of water pressure, but once we get up to full design flow, you know, where the pressure is dropping to 30 meters. Now, the valves are going to perform differently at different pressures. They are going to potentially be in a cavitation zone if they're in very high differential pressures. So we don't only just need to know the maximum, but we really need to get an idea of what that range is going to be throughout the flows. Now, most modeling engineers can come up with some of that information. So we're talking about head loss and pipes and networks to give us an understanding because if we don't know this, then it can be a problem in the event that we do have a rare event that we don't have the energy for the valve to operate and we can't get the demand. So it's important to get an idea of the range of the inlet pressures. So what do we do at Bermad? We've gathered all this information. And um, one of the things uh, I've been with Bermad for more than 21 years is that Bermad's always prided itself on a lot of industry experience and really understanding how the valves operate. The Bermad sizing software, which we have, doesn't only give us a snapshot of how a valve is going to perform in one flow, but we can, as you look at this um, uh, picture on the left-hand side here, you can see the software where we've got a, a pressure-reducing valve we're trying to size in, in, in 150 millimeters, and we're looking at 10% of the time the flow is going to be in this consideration, but the 70 percentile will be here, and maybe 20% we have the low flows on the left. 
So what the sizing software does for us and what it does for you as a potential client or user or designer is it gives you a snapshot of exactly how that valve is going to perform today. We can do that for those flows today. We can do it for future flows. We can do it for design flows. And it gives you a good idea of what the valve was actually designed for. So if we think potentially 15 years down the track and we're seeing that the design that we put in really wasn't performing, well, let's go back to what we considered was the original information we were given to actually design it. Okay, so we can see here that we've got a maximum flow of 50 liters a second. We're actually finding we're actually peaking at 80 today. We hadn't considered this. So we can, it's a really good snapshot of an idea to tell us how it's going to perform. It's going to tell us clearly here the percentage the valve's open. So if we look at this particular case, and maximum flow of the valve is 45% open. Um, we're getting a very good idea on the noise level. So now this is a really critical point of any design uh, because if we are designing a pressure reducing station, it's out in the country or it's in an area that uh, hasn't got houses or it's, it's maybe got some factories around on it and it's making a small amount of noise, that's fine. But what if in 10 years time there's a lot of houses around us and these valves are generating 70 to 80 decibels of noise at night and it's keeping homeowners and everything else uh, there, it's, it's, it's a problem. So a lot of engineers and water authorities want to know potentially what the noise levels are going to be. And we get asked this all of the time. The software gives us a very good snapshot of what that's going to be. And why that's important is that it helps us or helps you as designers to say, well, what are we going to do about the noise? Are we going to put it in the pit to suppress the noise? Are we going to put acoustic enclosures around it? Or are we going to do other things hydraulically that can reduce those effects? And there's things that we can do inside the valve with the trim. There's a multitude of things. The point is, is that this is a really good snapshot and we provide this uh, reports to you, the designers or the users, so that you can get an idea and have confidence that we're not guessing. And it's not just a case of, yeah, it'll be right. Now, these are the facts. This is how it's going to work. So this is good engineering data for you. And this is part of anything that we do in selecting a valve. So we've selected a valve. Um, we want to know a little bit about the network that it's providing. So is it what we call a single feed supply with a bypass? So in other words, is there only one pipeline that is supplying this uh, 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 network of, of, of pipes? And why we want to know that is that at some stage, we have to maintain this valve. Now, the majority of the maintenance which we do doesn't require a valve to be taken offline. It can be done quickly and simply and easily with a, um, several maintenance techniques without taking the valve offline. But there is, uh, for any part of the product, there is a, an opportunity where we may have to remove the, the, the valve internals and inspect the valve seats and the internals and the V-port, etc. That means taking the water offline. Now, why is that important? Well, if it's, a, a, if it's an authority where we're supplying buildings, factories, and homes, we do not want to switch the water supply off. So we may have to put a bypass valve in here that says, well, we're going to put a standby valve that's going to enable us to, to maintain the water supply and still do the maintenance on the valve safely. Um, or it could be a single feed supply that's filling a reservoir. And can we take the valve offline for four hours to check the internals? Absolutely. It's fine. So these are the things we're going to ask you is, is it a single feed supply? And if so, then we'll consider possibly putting a bypass in or giving you some suggestions on how we can design a system that doesn't interrupt the water supply. Now, many authorities tend to have uh, multiple feeds. So this could be a situation where we're providing in a city centre here or uh, in a part of a development uh, a, a pressure reducing valve to fill that. But maybe six kilometres away, we have another feed that supplies that from the south end of town instead of the north end of town. So we call this a multiple feed supply, supplying into a network. Now, why is that important for us to know as a designer? Well, the water will always take the least form of resistance feeding this DMA. Um, if we know that the bulk of the water is going to come from the north and only some of it comes from the south, it gives us an idea how to proportionalize the valve and how to make sure that we get the best performance out of it. We don't want 90% of the flow going through one valve and 10% through another. 
Or we can even have situations where we have 100% of the water going through one and the other valve is redundant, not doing anything, and it only comes in in a rare event. And that can be an issue. So this is what we mean if we're asking you, is it like a single feed supply or is it a multiple feed supply going into the network that you're providing? Okay, let's take a snapshot in time. Uh, let's go back 20 years ago. Um, when we used to provide a single feed supply, if we look at this picture on the right-hand side, this is a, a, a pressure reducing station for drinking water. And we can see the three valves at the bottom in here. We have a 50 millimeter, a 150 millimeter, and a 300. And this was supplying a drinking water network uh, in a holiday uh, type region. And um, why did we have the three valves? Well, in the early days, a lot of the valves really, um, they didn't have the capability of working in a very wide uh, flow range. But today it's very, very different. You can see here on the discharge of the, the, the three valves is a pressure relief valve heading off to the left there, just to safeguard the network too as well. But most valves in the early days had what we called a, a flat disc or a flat seat. And what we mean by that is that the valve really doesn't have a great potential to work at very, very low flows. It works in a nice, comfortable band, and it doesn't tend to work terribly well at exceptionally low flows. But for the last 20 or 30 years, we have a whole variety of different components we can put inside the valve, like the V-port plugs here, which give us the ability to run down to zero flows in many instances. So we also have today in high differential pressure conditions, we have cavitation cages like shown here, where we have a single cage or a dual cage. And these are components which basically say, look, instead of having a design like we see on the right-hand side here, where we have three valves to really cope with the flows and the pressure demands and everything else, it might be a situation where we can have a demand with one 300 millimeter valve to do the entire situation. So things have changed. There's, uh, you know, obviously uh, Bermad is one of the leading manufacturers in the world of diaphragm actuated control valves, and they're constantly developing their products. You know, and today, you know, as well as being Australian standard approved, this product really has the ability to, to work in a very, very wide band. So designs today can look very, very different to what we had in the past. And this just gives you a bit of an idea of the old and the new here to see that what can be done in instances like that. So if we think about, I'm going to use a practical example here. Um, this is the logic of a single feed supply with a bypass. So here we're looking at, if you look at the picture on the right to start with, we have a 100 millimeter valve in the, in the, the distance there with a, a strainer before it, and it's running into a water network and we have a smaller 50 millimeter valve before it. So the issue, and if we look to the, uh, the flow rate range on the left-hand side, the graph that we've got there, we can see the 24 hour clock there with the flow capacity, and we can see the, um, uh, the flow rate vertically in the vertical there, unit two as well. So one of the things that we don't like to do in a pressure reducing valve is have a valve that's redundant and doesn't actually operate. Now, what we mean by that is, is that um, a lot of, if we looked at this picture on the right hand side, let's just say, for example, the 50 millimeter valve, which handles the low flows, can do 100% of the daily flow rate. And the 100 millimeter valve only supplements the flow in the event of a fire or in a rare event that might happen once or twice a year. The issue with that is, is that we can have dead water sitting behind that 100 millimeter valve. Now, water quality engineers don't like dead water going into the main, so we can get discoloration, we can get low chlorine content, and it can also affect the performance of the valve. Control valves like to operate. So one of the things which we do, um, we, the other thing is that we don't like to drive the small valve to very, very high flow rates. We want these valves to last for 20, 30, 40 years. So we know that if we have parallel valves, one of the things we don't like to do is to run exceptionally high flow rates through the small valve. Why? Because it's going to wear out. It could be subject to cavitation, and it's not good for the long term of the product. Uh, at the same time, we don't want the, uh, the valve on the left not to operate. We actually want it to continue for water quality reasons, like I mentioned before, and reasons of reliability. So if we look at the graph on the left here, what we tend to do is we say, well, look, let's Let's limit the flow through this um, 50 millimeter network to 6.5 liters a second. And let's ensure that every day 
we get that 100 millimeter valve to actually open. Now, how we, we do that is we add a mechanical flow stem to the small valve. Now, it's probably a little difficult for you to see in the picture, but in the 50 millimeter valve, there's a brass stem in the middle in there. So what we're doing is we're basically saying, what we want to do is keep both the valves active every day. And that keeps the water quality good, keeps the velocity through the small valve at a conservative level, and ensures that, that both valves are designed for the long term and they really work well. So a lot of the time uh, we, we discuss with you the possibilities and the designs of incorporating something like this to ensure that we give a good uh, a design station that works well today, six months, 12 months, and in 20 years. And this is some of the logic which we use in some authorities when it's just a single feed type supply. Okay, now, one of the things is that I mentioned before about having uh, multiple valves coming into one location. And I did mention before that sometimes what we don't want is to have a pressure reducing valve that doesn't operate. Now, it's not that it's going to fail, but it has more potential to, if it's sitting dormant, doing nothing for one year, two years of its time, it's a problem. If I look at this particular installation here, this was a pressure reducing valve that was used as a bypass around a large reservoir. So in this network, we had water supply filling a reservoir and the reservoir was like a brick pressure tank. The water would gravitate out through the reservoir, out through the network. But if there was a problem with the tank in that they had to put some divers in there or do some maintenance on the tank and take the tank offline, you wanted this pressure reducing valve to operate and to, to maintain the same pressures that the time was used to. So if we look at this particular design, you can see the water flowing from left to right. We can see the, um, the inlet butterfly valve, the control valve, and then we see the, the second butterfly valve on the downstream side, which is closed into the network. Now, before there, you can see a T-piece with a hydrant. So one of the things that we might do, and I've learned through many authorities, is that it's good to test the valve before you bring it online. Uh, so what an operator might do here is they'll put a hydrant in here, in here before they put it online. You'll open the hydrant, they'll allow water to flow, which means we're getting rid of the dead water. We're testing the valve operation, we're stroking the valve and opening and closing it. And we're ensuring by modifying the position of the hydrant that the PRV is operating as it's designed. So it's a good way to be able to test a valve before bringing it online. So there could be a lot of valves for a variety of reasons that are going to be redundant in the network, but are needed uh, in emergency situations. This is a really good way of a design by putting a small uh, hydrant in there or a test valve to test it before bringing it online. And I just thought this was a, an ideal picture to demonstrate that and to show it. So sometimes that's a good thing to incorporate uh, if you have a redundant PRV. Okay, so we've uh, we've now looked at um, the, the, we've got the hydraulic data on the valves, we've selected a valve, we've suggest, suggested a, a, a multitude of different valves or a single valve. What do we do with it now? Do we put it above ground? Do we put it below ground? What are the pros and cons? And uh, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of that, that process to, to give you some decision-making ideas which operators and designers have given us in the past that might make your life easier to design one of the two. So let's talk about above ground installations. So we can see a couple of pictures here where we have one valve out in the open um, supplying uh, a rural part of, of, of the country, supplying a pressure reducing station. And then we have another pressure reducing station in a brick building there. It's still above ground. It's above ground and it's providing it there. So why would you consider putting it above ground? Let's talk about some of these things. First thing is, is that to an operator who has to maintain the valve, uh, it's easy to work on it if it's above ground. I can get access to it. Um, I'm not in a confined space in a pit. I can easily get one person who can come to the valve and operate and work on it. Um, one of the things which is exceptionally important from uh, an operator's safety point of view is that in many of the water authorities which we work at, you know, we have uh, permits required for confined space entry. And in some cases, when we put valves below ground in pits, we have what we call a confined space uh, certificates required. And what that may mean is that, yes, I'll be able to have an operator go down into the valve pit with breathing apparatus. Uh, I need to have two operators upstairs, one with a harness, one just monitoring the device to, to safeguard the person that's in the pit. But if we're 
today we don't have a lot of operators working on these valves. If we're above ground, we can have one operator come to the valve and work on it safely. No confined space, you can get to the valve simply, you can see it, it's easy to get to. So it's efficient. It means that we have one operator doing maintenance on the valve instead of three. So it becomes a financial decision and stuff too as well. And we don't need that. My personal preference is if you can put it above ground, do it because it's so much better for the operators. But let's talk about the, the, the cons or disadvantages here. So as I mentioned when we were suggest, uh, suggesting the type of valve is that we can do different trims to the valve and different designs that have different decibel ratings. But at the end of the day, regardless of that, if you're working on a high differential in installation, it could be that the noise level is just not suitable. Now we can see the top picture here is out in the open. There's no houses nearby. A little bit of noise isn't gonna affect anyone. I know, for example, when I took this picture of the bottom one, it's right next to houses. So what they've decided to do here is to put it inside a brick building to suppress some of that noise, keep the weather off the valve and stuff too as well, and, and make it. Uh, uh, so, so noise suppression is something to consider. Um, one of the, the disadvantages potentially if it's outdoors, if you're in a frost prone region, uh, you know, where you've got very cold temperatures that could drop below zero, we could have issues with frost. Um, now, there's, frost is a whole other topic, but it depends what part of the country you're in. Obviously, Australia is a very big place. Um, but if we were down in Tasmania or we were up in Darwin, we have very different aspects to, to talking about frost. So that's one of the things to consider. Um, vandalism, you know, if we're above ground, uh, the valve's out in the open. As we can see, we've got a cage around it just to keep people away. But kids being kids, they might do some vandalism to the valve. This is a critical valve. We don't want people to damage it. So it could be something we're to consider. Um, it's not always possible, of course, to put above ground. We could be in the very center of a big city where we simply just haven't got the room and the practicality to put it there. And for many councils and for many water companies, it might not look so good to have valves above ground sitting there if it's in the country and it's not offending anybody, no big deal. But um, as a rule of thumb, you know, we find a lot of valves, even in big cities, that are above ground. But in many cases, they're below ground. So let's now talk a little bit about below ground installations. Uh, there's many reasons, and I've got some different pictures here identifying a few. So we can see the top picture there is a, a pressure reducing station in a valve pit, concrete level. We can see the ladders going down there so we can see what the operator has to do. You know, the middle installation there shows the installation in a very large city. It's compact, it's quite tight. It's got a lot of other components in it and stuff too as well, so it's tight. And the bottom one there, of course, showing a, a valve being submerged, which have, happens frequently. So let's talk a little bit about some of the advantages. Um, the, if it's below ground, typically the pipe is the majority of the time is below ground. So if the pressure reducing station can break into a single or a multiple train below ground, it means it's avoiding a lot of the bends, elbows, thrust blocks, and everything having to come above ground. It keeps it quite simple, in other words. In many cases, that's more practical for where it actually is. If it's below ground, and let's say the transfer pipeline is on a major highway or crossing a highway or on a road or on a pavement, for example, it can be that it can be underground and there can be pits across the top where traffic can pass across it. Now, that's practical in that uh, it saves costs by not having to offset the PRV. But of course, it can be a disadvantage in that, well, when we come to maintain it, it's, it's a problem for access too as well. But it usually means that it, it can be done quite simply and easily to, to that degree. It can reduce cost. Uh, what we mean by that is, is that it's avoiding all those thrust blocks, it's avoiding bends, T's coming above ground, air valves and other components. But I guess one of the key reasons why a lot of the operators will consider putting it below ground is not so much cost related, but it's noise related. So when I was demonstrating on the sizing program, we can see that at different conditions and at different percentages the valves open or different hydraulic conditions, we can get a varying level of decibels of the, the noise of the level of the valve. So by putting in a valve pit, we know through experience, if especially if it's got gadget covers and it's in a concrete pit, it can suppress a lot of that noise. And that's important if it's going to be in a residential area where you're going to want to make sure that, that noise isn't affecting uh, the, the residents close by. Let's talk about some of the disadvantages here. 
Now, some of these disadvantages, the information that I've gathered has come from operators, it's come from users and some designers and stuff too as well. So within many of the water companies, in order to go into a below ground pit, each water authority or, or council has, has a varying definition of what we call a confined space. And a confined space is where it's potentially dangerous for an operator. So we want to put a gas detector down there. We want to put an operator down there with a harness. We want to have somebody upstairs holding the harness and somebody spotting you at the same time. So to do a simple maintenance on a filter station every six months means I need three people. So it can be costly. From an ongoing operator's perspective, the ongoing costs are expensive. You know, if I've got three people coming out twice a year to do that instead of one, there's a, there's a cost associated with that. The, the other thing that I've heard from a lot of the water companies is uh, I've got an emergency breakdown situation. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm on call. I've got to race out to this PRV station. I've got to go down in the pit. Let's look at the picture on the top of the page there. We can see the yellow ladders going down. These environments usually below ground are damp and they're, they're wet. And the potential for slippage and someone falling and hurting themselves is potentially there. I've been down in hundreds of L pits. And it is, you have to have your wits about you, but if you're on your own and you potentially damage yourself and hurt your head, it's it's a it's an issue. So there's an op health and safety issue to consider going in there too. Um, when we're talking about op health and safety, it's a damp environment where potentially you can get spiders, snakes. Uh, I've been to many of those cases where, you know, redback spiders or something like that, or, you know, if you've got a brown snake in there, that's very dangerous to an operator and you can't see them. now. It doesn't mean you can't get those uh, snakes and spiders above ground, but you know they tend to find dark uh, places to hide and all that sort of stuff. So it just means that we've got a, an op uh, a more dangerous environment from an operator's perspective. From an actual perspective of, I need to maintain the valve. If we look at that middle picture, for example, here we've got pressure transmitters, we've got motorized pilots, we've got electrical cables, we've got water. And it's a very confined space. This is a 200 millimeter valve. And we can see here, it's a very tight, confined space to actually get into to work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, a designer will say, look, um, Colin, can I have the side of the valve within 100 millimeters of the concrete wall? And you can say, well, look, you can. But from an operator's perspective, he's got to get his arm in there to get spanners to remove the actuator. And it's not always easy. So it's really quite challenging. And when you're down in a valve pit here, you're trying to work on everything and you've got a mixture of electricity and water, it's dangerous. And it's certainly the risk of, uh, and I've been in this actual situation where uh, pits have flooded before, uh, something has gone wrong and uh, a fitting is broken or a, um, a gibbalt has given way or something. And it can be very dangerous for an operator too as well. Above ground, yes, you still have those same issues, but you're not in a confined area that can be dangerous to an operator. And Look, the bottom picture is a little bit of tongue in cheek, but this is the reality of sometimes what happens. If the valve pit is not fully sealed, um, if it's open, open grating at the top, the valve can submerge. Now, it's not that the valve can't work when it's fully submerged, but obviously it's not ideal. We can get corrosion, we can't see the valve, we can't work on it, we have to get pumps in to empty the pit. It's not great. So what I've been able to demonstrate there is a little bit of the decision making on above ground or below ground, uh, whether it's practical or it's good, and each different person is going to have a different perspective on it. But there is the best of both worlds. So what some people have said to us is, Colin, we want to have the valves in a pit. In this case, we can see in this picture, the, the pressure reducing station was all prefab by one of our good contractors in stainless steel with Victolic joints to make it very easy to get in and out. But the, op the uh, water company didn't actually want the operators to go into the valve pit to do the regular maintenance. So what they've actually done here, if you see to the left-hand side, they've actually put the controls or the components that require the frequent maintenance right at ground level. So on this particular case, the valve pits came on the top, they opened an inspection hatch and they could do 90% of the maintenance from the top of the pit without having to get in. Now, of course, it meant that the operator was on his knees and he was bent over, but there was no heavy lifting involved. It was quite straightforward. And this made life a lot easier. And as you can see in this other one here, this is another station with some 300 millimeter valves. You can see on the picture on the right, just some sunlight coming down. And that was the inspection hatch that enabled the operator to do the bulk of the work from the top. 
Now, it doesn't mean that the operator never has to come into the pits. You know, to do a major uh, shutdown, they'll have to lift the lids and get in there and do it. And that's always possible too as well. But for the bulk of the maintenance that happens you know, over that 10 years, we don't want to get in the valve pit. And this is one of the ways in doing it. So there are, if you're doing risk analysis for this type of thing, there are risks with doing this. Um, here we can see on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we were using a uh, flexible high-pressure nylon tube. And that worked really well, or you can do it in copper or in stainless steel. Um, some of the issues that can happen with this, an operator might get in the valve pit and jump, uh, stand on the, the, the nylon tube, it comes away and a valve opens. So this is shown in a fairly crude form. Of course, you can see on the right-hand side that all the, the tubes are in a conduit, so they're protected to stop that sort of situation. So I'm showing the good on the right to the bad on the left, that minimizes that risk and the risk of something else going wrong. And one of the things that we are always happy to do is that to have, when you do a risk analysis on one of these stations about what potentially can happen and go wrong, you know, we're very good and we have the experience in being able to, to assist you with that and stuff too as well. In many instances, they take it to the next level. So here we can see three stations, you know, some with a multitude of valves below ground but they've actually moved the entire controls to above ground in cabinets. And this is becoming quite common. So what we're going to see above ground is a nice environmental green cabinet, with which really isn't going to have any noise issues to it. Everything's accessible. We can see it all there. The, the one thing that I would say about above ground cabinets, if you don't really have the experience in designing a cabinet mm -hmm. to remove a pilot, to check on one of the fittings, it can be challenging because you need small fingers and sometimes the contractors put it in a fairly tight cabinet and it's quite small and compact. I've got pressure transmitters in there, I've got air valves, I've got other components that might leak onto the electricity. So there's lots of good design things that we can assist you with. We even build above ground uh, cabinet backing boards with all the components on it, we do it. Uh, but there's a lot of pros and cons in doing this and experience is one of the keys to getting this and doing it right. Uh, a lot of the time, you, you can see the control tubes running down to the valve. So this is another possibility. And it's something that we can discuss with you if you're interested in that design. Uh, it ensures that someone's not on their knees working below ground, but they're working at a safe working height. So it's you know thinking about an operator's back uh, and they're not bent over and doing sort of work that's difficult. Uh, you can see the one in the middle here operating three valves. It's quite complex. Um, it looks like a lot of tubes there and a lot of filters and components. Can be a little daunting when you look at it stuff too as well there's pros and cons on all of those assemblies but that's something to consider so the next aspect to a pressure reducing station is we frequently get asked the question do we need to put a large strainer in before the pressure reducing valve itself now, i'm not referring to the the little line strainer we use in the control line for the pilots etc but this is for the in the actual pipeline itself do we need to put a strainer inside the valve itself? Now, the Bermad 700 series Y pattern type design is really practical and generally doesn't need a strainer. The, the Y pattern type design you can see in the picture on the right hand side there has no lower bearings or guide stems. And if a solid was to come through, there's a high probability that that will simply pass through into the network rather than jamming in the bottom of the valve and keeping the valve open. But there are many reasons why you may want to consider putting a strainer in. And here we can see uh, some strainers fitted in a raw water situation where we had some large strainers before the PRV. And what this did is that it, it of course, makes the station a little bigger, slightly more expensive, and uh, it becomes a, a bigger process. So why would you consider using a strainer? And these are some of the things that I think are probably critical. It's all about getting back to that risk analysis again. If this was what we called a critical station, so this is supplying a very old network of AC pipe or fragile pipe that's, that's subject to cracking or breaking if you have pressure variations. Sometimes if we have lumps of concrete that came off the liner of the main and jammed the valve open and the valve didn't shut down, that could be catastrophic to a network. It could be raw or untreated water. So like this picture on the right hand side, this wasn't using drinking water, but it was using untreated river and dam water. And we had, there was a potential to get things like eels, um, 
construction debris, uh, anything like uh, uh, we can get yabbies or, or, or fish that might jam inside the valve and might make the valve malfunction. One of the big things is that if you're working on a brand new installation where there's a lot of new infrastructure beforehand, a lot of new pipe work going in, let's say they were using poly pipe or they're using any nature of pipe, there could be poly shavings, there could be any construction debris that was done through the construction or laying of the pipe. And if that got into the valve, uh, it could be catastrophic for the downstream network. So one of the things to be really careful of is to ensure that if we think there's an element of risk of that, we may want to put that strainer in there. Now, usually it generates very little of any head loss, but naturally it will gain more head loss if it starts to block. But it's there as an insurance policy. So if you've done a risk analysis and you've decided and said, look, we want to minimize that risk. Uh, we want to insure. And for the little cost that it does, let's do it now and safeguard it. That's, that's fine. And that's up to the operator. But generally, it's not required in most installations. So the water was clean. I don't need a strainer. And I've heard that many times before. This picture you can see in the center was one particular picture I took on a, a new installation and I had to come out calling the valves not working. I pulled out bits of, of uh, it looked like tubing, there was poly shavings, there was rags in there. And I'm really not exaggerating when I say this, having been commissioning valves for the last 30 years, what you're seeing on the left-hand side there, some of the things that we've seen in valves, we've seen poly shavings, pipe gaskets, rock, timber, grit, uh, concrete pipe linings come off. We've had multitude, unfortunately, of animals, platypus, eels, fish, turtles, wombats, sheep, possums. We've had, uh, you know, sometimes if the pipe's been constructed that wasn't capped off overnight, we've we had sheep, we've had wombats, and it's terrible. They've ended up in the valves as shown here, and poly shavings in the strainer and stuff too as well. So the key thing about this is, is that I'm not trying to scare you into saying you need to put a strainer in. It's something else that has to be maintained. It's all about risk. If your station design was such that we're going into a brand new network, we're only dropping 10 or 15 meters across this PRV. If we did have a situation where something had, it's not catastrophic and it's going to do it. Okay, so let's keep it simple, not put one in. But if the risk analysis says, you know, look, the water's going to be clean conscious, it's drinking water, but we've had it so many times where we've had, uh, where we've had people doing road work, uh, maintaining our roads, and little lumps of concrete have come off the inside of uh, uh, the, the pipelining and jammed under the valve. If it was untreated water, we've you know we've we've had turtles, fish, eels that suck up against the valve and create issues inside the valve. So it's a matter of if the cost of the valve jamming open was going to be substantial because it would cause downstream pipe breakages, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the small investment in putting a strainer in beforehand is worth it. That's not for me to determine, but for you to think about and determine whether that's going to be practical or not. Now, one of the really critical aspects to coming above ground or even below ground is the issue of, do I need an air release valve at the installation and is it important? And where do I put it? And what type of valve should I use? When we're designing any pipeline, we generally don't want any inclusion of air inside a pipeline at all. Why? Because it's compressible. One of the facts of the matter is, is that when you reduce the pressure in a pipeline, air comes out of solution. So if that air comes out of solution and follows the pipeline and follows up to the um, an air release valve further down the track, happy days. But air constantly comes out of solution when you reduce the pressure. And the greater the differential pressure, the greater the flow rate, the more that becomes an issue. When that air collects on the downstream side of a valve or collects at a high spot, it's potentially collapsible. And when it's collapsible, that makes a pressure reducing valve on a hunt and carry on and, and make it not a great option. So the thing is, I would strongly recommend if you are putting an air release valve or thinking about putting an air valve, speak to us about where we think we want to do it. As you can see in the picture on the left-hand side is a large station here under, under construction. You can see valves, air valves black on the downstream side and some on the upstream side. Now, some people say, well, look, if I put it on the upstream side, it avoids any air going into the PRV. And that's true. But if air comes out of solution on the downstream side under a lower pressure zone, that's where it accumulates and creates an issue. So being able to automatically release that air downstream is critical for a pressure reducing station. It's a very small capital investment, 
but it's a long-term investment in ensuring you get very good performance. The type of valve you use downstream needs to have an automatic function or it needs to be a combination air valve or a combination valve with surge protection. It needs to be a valve that can automatically release that entrained air to ensure that the valve's not gonna hunt. Because regardless of brand, nature, and design, this might not be an issue when you first set it up or you set up the situation, but it's going to accumulate and get worse as time goes on. And we've seen this in many, many instances before. If you're putting valves above ground, the question has always been, so where do we locate that air valve con? Do we put it on the bend going downstream? Or I've seen this type of situation here. This is with a major water company. By putting a collection T, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you can see it's got a T on the upstream side with pressure transmitters and an air valve and one on the downstream side as well. This is really good designs in my opinion. Why? Because the air has got only one place to go when it comes out of solution downstream. That's vertically upwards and into the air valve. If you've got a long radius bend, elbow on the downstream side, do I put it at the high spot or do I put it on the bend? And there are good design principles of what to do that. And we can assist you with whatever your design looks like to consider where to do it. But in these two instances that you can see in the picture here, there categorically won't be an issue with entrained air making a valve bounce and, and create an issue with, with ins insufficient performance downstream if the air valves are connected like this. Now that might not be practical in all instances. And to put a T in rather than a long radius bend is not always the best hydraulic solution, but if the velocities are modest and it's not creating undue turbulence, it's a good solution in, in my opinion. The next question has been, do I need a pressure relief valve located downstream of the pressure reducing valve? Now, theoretically, a pressure reducing valve, its main function is, I want to maintain a constant pressure downstream, regardless of upstream pressure, and regardless of flow. So if the valve is configured correctly and it's doing its job, you really have no real need or risk to put a pressure relief in if it's doing its job well. But there are external influences that really affect uh, what can happen in the pipeline downstream that the PRV can't react to. So in some instances, it's going to be worth considering this. So let's have an example here. We set the pressure reducing valve up to respond at a certain flow rate. We have needle valves and speed controllers that ensure that we maintain a constant downstream pressure of plus or minus one or two meters and it works beautifully. But let's assume downstream there's a potential for, there's a fire. If a fire, uh, the fire department come along and open up hydrants, they're interested in one thing only. That's opening up the hydrant, getting water and putting out the fire and switching it off. Are they concerned about water hammer and closing valves slowly? And No, they're interested in putting out the fire. It could be a case of there's an altitude valve downstream filling a reservoir and the valve is filling at too fast a rate and shuts off too fast. Now, if that altitude valve is five kilometers away from the PRV and we were using steel pipe, you know, if they shut it off too quick and they generate a pressure surge, it could be five seconds or 10 seconds before the PRV sees that high pressure. And it's all too light. You know, depending on the celerity of the, the wave speed inside that pipe, if it's, if it's a kilometer per second or if it's 200 meters a second, it's going to affect it. Now the PRV can only respond to the pressures at the valve can't respond to what's happening five, six kilometers down the track. So if it's a critical station where we really don't want to see high pressure surges caused by operators or something happening downstream, it's a good move to put a pressure relief valve in. Sometimes downstream of a PRV, you might have a pump station and that pump station might start and stop to fill a reservoir and the water runs through this PRV that it's feeding. So all of a sudden we might see a very rapid increase in flow and a rapid decrease in flow in those pumps start and stop. So unless the, the pump people control the rate in which the pump open and close at a controlled rate, the PRV might not see the constant downstream pressure. So it might be safe to put a relief valve in if that's the case. If it's, um, if it's what we call a critical pressure reducing station. So this is something that's gone into a very old network, very sensitive network that really can't take much differential pressure and it doesn't want any changes. It's a good amount of insurance policy to make sure if something does go wrong with the PRV, 
is there is some insurance. So again, it comes back to the the SWOT analysis of or the, the risk analysis of the, the PRV. Look, if something goes wrong and it breaks the pipe, the cost on a small pressure relief valve is maybe a good inclusion. And we can give you a good idea on how to size it and to how to determine where to put the water and what it's actually going to do. So one of the biggest things which really affect PRV stations is operators which have not been given good education. So these control valves can be a little daunting to operators sometimes. And if they're one of, the, I can remember one of the water companies saying to me, one of the times that we tend to see breakages in our pipes downstream is when operators do maintenance on the PRVs. Because some of the team that we use haven't been given the very latest training. They're not overconfident in getting it right. So when they bring the PRV online, they make a mistake and it overpressurizes and creates an issue. A pressure relief valve is a good way to, to make sure that that doesn't create an issue. So if they do make a mistake, it's a bit like saying, look, I've got the very best operators, they're well trained, but one small mistake by closing or opening one valve in the wrong a sequence might cause an overpressure condition. The relief valve is there to safeguard you. In my opinion, it's a good idea, and we can give you an idea how to size it, where to put it, where to distribute the water, and uh, how big does it need to work and what size is it gonna be? So we have a lot of experience in using it. I would say, I actually can't tell you what the exact percentage of PRV stations have really fells. It's not a great deal, but it's all deemed about risk. And we can assist you with that risk if you think you need one. Okay, so very important that valves are able to be isolated and be maintained. So here we can see a variety of different installations where we've got uh, butterfly valves or gate valves before and after valves that give us the possibility to isolate the valve and to ensure that we can remove the internals of the valve and actually do some maintenance. Some products mean that you can't use butterfly valves because it might impinge on the surface of the valve or do something. You can see the valve at the picture on the bottom left hand side using butterfly valves and in many instances the one on the bottom right hand side shows the butterfly valve hard up against the, the bear mad. Now, is it good practice to put it up against the side of the valve? It's not a big deal. You can do it. It's, it's practical. It can do it. But the thing is that it's sometimes it's good to have a, a gap there that just gives you... What we don't want with a pressure reducing valve is highly turbulent water coming in and out of the valve. And having it just spaced a small amount of distance away is a nice thing to have, but it's not always exactly needed. Sometimes it creates a straightening effect if the valve is fully opened and it creates a bit of a straightening effect as well. But the point is, is that you can use gate valves or butterflies on there. The important point here about the design is, is to ensure that you have the ability to isolate them. Uh, there's been many instances we've been to jobs where there's an upstream isolation, but there's nothing on the downstream side. So they've had to drain a section of the pipeline out to enable you to get to it. So the point is, it's not a, so much about the design of the valve. Uh, gate valves are often used because they can't close quickly. So we don't want to generate water hammer if there's large flows. Butterflies are a little faster to close, but if they're with a gear operator, that can be slow too as well. But the key point to you as a designer is, we would like, ideally, to be able to isolate the valve on both sides to do major service on the valves that might be every 10 years or 15 years. And that's the point of this slide. So in summary, when I look at some of the designs on the right-hand side in there, we can do a multitude of different functions on these valves. The good thing about these diaphragm actuated control valves is that we can do this picture you see on the top here was on a very, very high risk PRV that had a multitude of different safety factors. And the risk analysis basically said, we want to limit the flow. We uh, want to have an overpressure guard. We want to have duty and standby large filters. We want a flow control system. We want all sorts of functions in there that says, look, we just cannot afford to have failure downstream. And that's fine, we can do all of those things. But the thing you always have to come back to is, and we do very good training on our valve, how daunting do some of those valves look to an operator? So in my opinion, we're practical, we're possible. We like to keep the design as simple as possible. We like to keep it as uniform as possible to, if a company is using a multitude of valves, if we have the valves in a uniform build, configuration and design, it's good for the operators. It's, 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 it's familiar. I can come to this valve and see it, understand it. I know how it works. 
But when sometimes when they see this, and even me after many years, I look at this and I still get sweaty palms thinking about how to maintain this because there's a lot of brains all working at once in there. And if you don't quite understand it, and you may have the training at some time, it can be an issue. So as a designer, the best thing I would suggest is try to keep the system as simple as practical or as possible. One of the things that we've found has been one of the most successful things when a design is station is made is that the designer talks to the operations department as well as the design team. When you get uh, a lot of experience from operators that say, look, that's a nice design, but I'm not going to be able to maintain that. This is what we'd like to do to be able to make it easier. And I think a good team that talk to one another about what's important for the design to keep the cost down, but what's practical to maintain, is really good if they are talking to one another and getting advice from their own operators too as well. But the most important thing is if you can gather as much information about how the system's going to work now and in the future before the design is implemented, that's the key to success. So many times when we get to a station, they send you the flow rates. It's going to be up to 40 liters a second. Maximum pressure is going to be 100 meters. We want to re reduce to 20 downstream. What can you give us, Colin? I can give you something with a snapshot of that, but can you give me an idea of what it's, else it's going to do? Because when the valve doesn't work, and we didn't have that information, it means that we just didn't have the, the, the right information to make the right design. So one of the most important things from my perspective is, when we're designing anything, talk to us, give us a call, and or go back in this uh, seminar and look at some of those information and the, the things that make our life and make hopefully the design a lot better. So by gathering that information, it's really, really critical. The thing that we find is that we have a very good relationship with our working with our customers and we have uh, state offices in every major place. Get to know the person who designs, operates and trains your operators. We're very proud about what we do and we really like to make sure the design works well. So good communication with your local Bermad office hopefully is going to make your design of a pressure reducing station a success. So thank you very much for taking the time to watch this seminar. I really hope that you're able to gain some of the practical experience which we've had over 30 odd years in working in pressure reducing stations. The key advice I'd have for you going forward is that we have many offices throughout Australia. Contact us at any of our state offices and speak with us and we're happy to share our experience and hopefully come up with a good design that works well for you. Thank you very much for watching.